الحمد لله الحمد لله مفيد العدل والإحسان وسبحان من خلق الإنسان وعلمه البيان وتبارك الذي رفع السماء وخلق الأرض ووضع الميزان وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله وعلى آله وصحبه الثقات الأبرار Big events throughout history often create ripples that have historical and political significance for years, decades, even centuries afterwards. For some, they fail to see the relevance of studying something that happened 10, 50, 100 years ago. But by recalling certain events throughout history, it allows us to see connections through time. Understanding history and historical events is how we understand the human condition. And when we, und- when we understand the human condition throughout history, uh, we can act on our responsibilities accordingly. This is most stark when we think about the mass atrocities such as genocide or ethnic cleansing of thousands, sometimes millions of human beings. Mass violence, torture, the violation of fundamental human rights, the mistreatment of human beings is, is not a new aspect to our history. The documentation of such events spans the whole of the historical record. So on the one hand, it's important for us to remember these atrocities to gain a greater understanding of what leads to these. Yeah, what are the psychological, the cultural, the political factors uh, that lead to such human cruelty and mass violence and genocide? But more importantly than that, more importantly, we need to remember the victims, who they were. We make dua for them. And we reflect on the fact that these were once actual living human beings. And we don't allow for their memory to be erased from history. This collective amnesia that settles in tends to happen periodically over time as time passes. Historical ignorance sets in, but the onus is on us really to remember, uh, to read, to remind others of what once happened on our very continent is what we're going to speak about today. So in July 1995, a genocide occurred where 8,000 Muslims were killed within the space of a few days. What's been referred to as the worst mass killing since World War II. Now, this wasn't an army versus an army. This wasn't uh, two sides or two equal sides fighting each other. This was the slaughter of defenseless civilians. In Serbia at the time, before the massacre, uh, there were certain telltale signs as to where the policy of those who ruled that particular territory at the time were going to lead to. The eventual goal of the Serbs or those, uh, those in the Republic of Serbia, was to annex the territory in Srebrenica in order to create a united, united uh, Serb Republic. The, the Serb soldiers, they imposed a embargo on food, supplies, humanitarian aid. And after some skirmishes occurred, they decided that they wanted to free certain uh, towns that were densely populated with Muslims up in order to create this United Serb Nation or territory. And before we before I carry on, just think about the fact that the majority population or the majority Muslim population in a particular town was wiped out because the ultimate goal was to replace them with another religion or ethnicity of people. And to this day, Srebrenica still belongs to the Serbs. The majority population was displaced by the Serbs and they now live there. So ultimately, and when we reflect on how things became the way that they are, they got exactly what they wanted. Now in the days leading up to the massacre, as we mentioned, they blocked uh, food, fuel, humanitarian aid. And Srebrenica was declared a UN safe area. Now, when the Serb army went into Srebrenica, they convinced the men to hand over their weapons. And basically, basically they said to her, they gave them assurances that they weren't going to, weren't going to attack them. They convinced them to hand over their weapons. They separated the men from the women and the children. The women and the children, uh, by and large, were put on buses and deported out of the town. And there's obviously reports when when in 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 such scenarios where there was rape and 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 torture 
what ensued during that month over the next five days was mass killing to the point where 8,000 were killed most of Srebrenica's 40, 40 odd thousand inhabitants were uprooted even beforehand they were uprooted and as a result of the embargo that was uh, enforced upon them with no food or humanitarian aid getting to them many many suffered from malnutrition and dehydration the international criminal tribunal they subsequently found that the killings in Srebrenica and the mass expulsion of the Muslims from that area amounted to genocide. So who was responsible for what happened in Srebrenica? Well, obviously the Bosnian Serbs or the, the senior Serb army generals and those who were calling the shots, they were to blame. And the blame was primarily pinned upon them. But the United Nations also, as they had taken it upon themselves to protect the inhabitants of Srebrenica, they also took it and uh, accepted a portion of the blame. They failed to protect the Muslim men, women and children in Srebrenica. Even after they had declared that particular area a safe, a safe zone. To the extent where uh, the UN Secretary General in 1999, uh, a few, few years after the atrocity, admitted to the fact that they'd failed the United Nations had failed to do their part in helping to save the people of Srebrenica from this campaign of mass murder. Now, this massacre didn't occur in the medieval period. This wasn't the Middle Ages. This wasn't hunter-gatherer societies. It wasn't tribal warfare. These weren't dynasties. Yeah, vying for world domination. This wasn't colonial times. This was 1995. This was during the lifetime of most of us. This is post-enlightenment. This is post-United Nations. This is post-United Nations Security Council. This is when we have the International Criminal Court. This is in a world where we have democracy and all the other things that are synonymous with progressive civilization. And Trebonita isn't an isolated incident. Now it's uncomfortable to mention these perhaps on, on a Friday talk and I appreciate it's a break from the usual type of reminder that we give. But this discomfort is necessary. Yeah, we should feel uncomfortable when these type of things are happening in the world during our lifetime. We should feel uncomfortable to the point where this discomfort moves us to do something about this. Yeah, so if we if we think about even in 1994 Rwanda, a huge massacre took place, where they say the collective the, the the failure of the world to act and protect uh, the civilian population there led to 800,000 defenseless men, women, and children to perish over a period of ten years. This is in 1994, and again Kofi Annan, the United Secretary General. In 2004, when reflecting on how they could have prevented this particular genocide, he says, you know, we have to acknowledge responsibility for the fact that we could have done more to prevent this particular genocide. So it seems like a cycle. There's this cycle of violence, this cycle of inability to act, this cycle, this cycle of unwillingness to act sometimes. That's 1994, just 26 years ago, just 25 years ago. We had the massacre in Srebrenica. Even uh, more recent than that is the Darfur genocide in Western Sudan, which from 2000, early 2000s, it still continues until today. Think about Sri Lanka, 2009, civilians killed on both sides in their thousands. Think about Rohingya today. In 2017, UN, UN investigators say that as many as 10,000 Rohingya were killed by, Buzz, by the Buddhist um, majority nation under the guise of Counter terror. There was, a, there was a report released just yesterday that they are still carrying out indiscriminate airstrikes, killing civilians, killing children during COVID 19, during the pandemic that we're experiencing. Reflect on the inhumanity of these people. If you think about Syria, the horrors of the past nine years, five million people have fled Syria. 
Six million people internally displaced. Over 100,000 civilians have died. 100,000 civilians have died in Syria over the past decade. In Gaza, you have, just last week it's been in the news, you have the occupied West Bank, where the Israelis are attempting to annex Palestinian land and build settlements. The whole world, the whole world, unanimously, apart from Israel and the US, believe that these are illegal settlements. And the calls from the international community to do something just fall on deaf ears, because nobody is really truly willing to do anything about this. If we reflect on China, there's a cultural genocide happening. You have horrible reports, even reports of forced abortions. The United Nations say that there are at least one million people allegedly detained in camps, in internment camps. And some estimates take it as far as three million. Now, all of these three million, one million, a hundred thousand civilians dead here, ten thousand people killed here. When we have no affinity and become completely desensitized to the people who have lost their lives in these places, they just become and are relegated to statistics. They're just abstract numbers. They're not real human beings. But reflect on what these numbers actually look like. The people that have passed away in Syria, 90,000, close to 100,000 people, 100,000, sorry. If we think about um, Wembley Stadium, the capacity at Wembley Stadium is 90,000 people. Let's just visualize that for a second. That whole stadium full of people. That whole stadium full of people. That many human beings have lost their lives. In fact, more than that have lost their lives in Syria. Visualize 8,000 people, the, the amount of people that di died in Srebrenica. 8,000 lives. Mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, wives, husbands. Imagine all of their lives being taken in an instant. All of these innocent lives taken. One thing that we learn is that this happens on every continent. This disease that leads to such atrocities happens absolutely everywhere. And all minorities, they all seem to be minorities, and all minorities suffer. Whether it's in the 1500s, whether it's in the 15th century, sorry, where Jews and Muslims were expelled at the hands of Christians in Spain. Whether it's the Armenian Genocide, where Christians are uh, persecuted at the hands of Muslims. Whether it's the Holocaust, where Jews are persecuted. Whether it's Muslims and, and Hindus during the partition of India. Even Muslims killing Muslims. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates leading a coalition where thousands of Yemenis are being starved to death. Starved. These aren't things that are happening in a distant land or in a distant period of time. They're happening right now. They're happening now during our lives. Literally as we speak some of these things. Perhaps Srebrenica is much more pertinent or much more relevant for us living in the West because the effects of it have felt very, very close to home. So, for example, Anders Breivik, the Norwegian who murdered 96 people using bombs and shooting in cold blood in Norway, he makes reference to the Serbian war in his manifesto and makes clear his opposition to Islam, which is exactly the type of campaign that they were leading. The terrorist who is responsible for the New Zealand mosque shootings, he played Serbian nationalist songs while streaming the shootings. These songs lionized the same leader who was convicted of the genocide of Bosnian Muslims. So I just wanted to reflect on the fact that these are important incidents in history. And they do send ripples throughout history that could potentially have an effect on what's happening with us today. Another thing we need to reflect on is the fact that genocide and ethnic cleansing doesn't just happen. People don't just wake up one day and decide that we hate and despise this particular ethnicity or this particular religion so much that we need to wipe them out. So there's something you can look up and these are the, the, what you can look up on the internet is stages of genocide and how genocide occurs. And we know as Muslims that we have checks in place to make sure that we do not allow our souls, or we do not allow our nafs to be overrun with hatred to the extent that we are capable of committing such atrocities. So for example, the very first step or the stage of genocide is classification. So we're entrenched, or well, these people who fall victim to this are entrenched 
with an us and them mentality. So in Shabanita, it was Muslims and Christians. This difference between the two was magnified and brought to the forefront. Muslims were otherized, and then eventually they were stripped of their essential humanity. And if you think about it, even today, we suffer from the same rhetoric, the political rhetoric of war on terror and hostile attitude. Which Muslim doesn't feel the hostile attitude towards Islam and Muslims in Europe? The second stage of genocide is symbolization, where people dress differently to distinguish themselves from each other. And just one example of what happened uh, in Bosnia was that there was this uh, different treatment of the Muslims at the time. So non-Serbs, for example, were forbidden to move around after four o'clock. They had a curfew. Non-Serbs or the Muslims were forbidden to swim or fish in local rivers. The Muslims were forbidden to gather in groups of three or more. The Muslims were forbidden from uh, in exchanging in certain transactions with each other. They were forbidden actually to speak with other Muslims from outside of their town, isolating them, and so on. So this categorization, and then this symbolization, and then this treatment and discrimination led essentially to the dehumanization, where, and we've heard this type of rhetoric, human beings are referred to as cockroaches. You have vermin, insects, they're diseased. There's this hate propaganda that the media spills out. And this tends to happen whilst the whole world is watching. Now the world might throw some gestures their way or look forward to the next peace talks or some other empty and ineffective way of responding to such a thing. Now from an Islamic perspective, we know that we can't even let alone Spill people's blood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تل... وَلَا Don't mock each other. We're not allowed to call each other by names. We're not allowed to refer to somebody else by their colour or certain characteristic they have or certain features that they have or maybe their weight. Or... We don't belittle people in this way. And those people who don't desist in mocking each other and calling each other by these names, they're wrongdoers and they need to reform themselves. So this obviously affects the social fabric and the relationship between human beings in any given community where we are not permitted to mock each other. Even to the extent where the greatest sin, and we believe as Muslim that the greatest sin is shirk billah, is to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and associate, uh, associate, um, associate uh, deity to anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah still says, وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ إِلْمٍ He says, don't curse these other gods that people worship. Because they'll just worship, they'll just uh, respond with exactly the same thing. Same thing. They'll, they'll start to curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's this recognition that when we do start to offend each other on the basis of these social categories, it can only lead to more of the same. Yeah, evil begets evil. Responding in a negative way just perpetuates the exact same cycle. And it's something that we have to refuse to partake in. In Islam we know that we have the concept of Hukuk al-Ibad. Hukuk al-Ibad is the rights of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these rights extend to absolutely everybody, regardless of background, regardless of religion or race or ethnicity or anything. So you have the rights of the parents, you have the rights of orphans, you have the rights of neighbours, you have the rights of uh, your spouse, you have the rights of your children, you have the rights of teachers, teachers have rights and duties, responsibilities towards their students. The guest has rights, the host has rights, animals have rights, plants have, line, has, have rights, the employee has rights. The list goes on and on. So the rights work both ways. There are rights and there are duties. We owe to one another regardless of religion or nationality or whatever else we want to label ourselves as. Now the next 
So what happened in Srebrenica is after the campaign of propaganda, you had the stage where they were willing to literally exterminate these people after having stripped them of their humanity. Now taking human life is one of, if not the greatest sin in Islam <coughs> after a shirk. The Prophet وسلم, as he was addressing the Muslim community in his final sermon, What did he start his address with? He starts his address to the Muslims by speaking about the sanctity of life. Inna dima akum wa amwalakum wa a'radakum alaykum haram. He says your blood and your property and your honor are forbidden for you to violate. Kahurmati yawmikum hada, like the sacredness of this day of yours. What does this mean? This address was given during Hajj. And it was given on the day of Arafah. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, he says about Dhul Hijjah, the month in which Hajj occurs, that there are no days which are greater and more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the ten days of Dhul Hijjah. That's how sacred these days are. And then Arafah is the pinnacle of these days. In fact, he refers in another hadith to Arafah as Al Hajj Arafah. The Hajj, he equates Hajj with Arafah. Hajj is Arafah. That's how great Arafah is. So on that particular day, so the Prophet ﷺ said, you imagine the sanctity and the sacredness of this particular day, just like this day is sacred. The blood of a human being is sacred. في بلدكم هذا Just like this land, this land that we're in, in, just like Mecca is sacred. Just like that, the life of a human being is equally sacred. And another occasion, the Prophet ﷺ, as he was doing tawaf around the Kaaba, he looked at the Kaaba and he said, Ma atyabak wa atyaba rihak. Yeah, how beautiful are you? How good are you? And how beautiful is your fragrance? Ma a'zamak wa a'zama hurmatak. Yeah, how great and sanctified are you? And then he goes on to, after exalting the praise of the Kaaba and reflecting on its beauty, he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Walladhi nafsu Muhammadin biyadi. After swearing an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَحُرْمَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِ أَعْظَمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ حُرْمَةً مِنْكَ He says that the sanctity of a believer, the sanctity of a mu'min is greater before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the sanctity of the Kaaba. Now the Kaaba is the most sacred site in Islam. And yet it, it doesn't compare to the drop of the blood of a mu'min. How many believers were slaughtered in Srebrenica? 8,000 plus. 8,000 plus. The Prophet wasallam also says in the hadith that the very first thing on the Day of Judgment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decide or judge or rule is the killing of innocent people. The first issue that will be judged amongst the people on the day of judgment are those who would shed people's blood. In another hadith, the Prophet says, لا يزال المؤمن في فسحة من دينه. A believer continues to essentially hope for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ما لم يصب دم حرام. As long as he doesn't shed blood. Unjustly. So the shedding of blood is a incredibly grave thing and something that we definitely don't want to be in a position where we face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having engaged in anything like that. So reflect on those who have not just shed the blood of one person but countless people. They have the blood of hundreds and thousands of people on their hands. Accountability is something we as Muslims believe ultimately lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the generals who were involved, they'll be accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The soldiers, they'll be accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The bystanders, everyone will be asked about their role in what they did. And when you're before Allah, the denial, which is the next stage 
of genocide. So after having classified people, after having dehumanized them, after having exterminated them, the very last stage of genocide they speak about is denial. And that's exactly what we see with Srebrenica. So the Serbs now are denying that it happened. Even after people have been convicted, even after all the investigations have literally dug up mass graves, there's denial taking place. And the Serb leaders, when they're interviewed, they say, no, 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 we, we, we were for peace. And the Quran mentions such an attitude when they say, Yeah, they say that they are peacemaker, peacemakers or peacekeepers. But all they do is spread corruption in the earth. So they try to pull the wool over people's eyes, but it's so blatant what they're doing. So blatant when they try to bury evidence. So blatant when they try to deny. But unfortunately for us, what happens is after this denial, and after the event has occurred, it's just business as usual. We, it's almost like we just revert back to square one. Despite the fact when you go to Srebrenica, they say that where some of the shootings took place, you can still see the bullet holes in the walls of certain buildings. You can still see that the walls are splattered with bullet holes where people have been slaughtered. Yet they still deny. So it's very important for us brothers and sisters to remember, to remind each other, to educate and to start ridding ourselves as well of the vices that lead to such atrocities. So pride, envy, lust, anger, greed, gluttony. These are just some of the traits that lead to such atrocities. And the biggest one, I believe, is people thinking that they are not accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَا يَطْغَى أَرَّآهُ اسْتَغْنَى إِنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الرُّجَىٰ yeah, Surely man, he transgresses when he deems himself independent. He thinks he's self-sufficient. He thinks he doesn't have anybody to answer to. He thinks that he's the maker of his own wealth and destiny and all of these other things. إِنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الرُّجَىٰ Don't worry about it. You'll, you'll be returning to Allah. That's where your ultimate destination and abode is. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll stand before him. So this pursuit that these people have for power and wealth leads to hate and resentment. And this is what fueled the atrocities like that of Srebrenica and others. The oppressor has to hate his victim in order to rationalize his behavior. When you know what you're doing is wrong, how do you justify such heinous crimes? It can't occur unless you degrade other people, unless you vilify people. And then and only then will you be giving yourself a license to engage in wrongful acts. So this hate and this aggression uh, that is directed towards the victims unfortunately only begets other hate and aggression and violence from the other side. Or definitely a resentment when issues are covered up, when nobody takes responsibility, when nobody is coming to the aid of the victims, when the perpetrators, years down the line, start to deny and erase the memory, the collective memory of what happened. Now the nature of tyrants is, as we know from the Quran, such that they are deaf, dumb and blind. Deaf in terms of, they don't hear the cries of their victims as they're engaging in such mass atrocities. And blind to the fact that Although they see what they're doing, it doesn't register in their hearts what they're doing. This lack of vision, it not only affects their eyes, well, it doesn't affect their eyes, but it affects their heart. Because at its core, that's what the vision, that's what the, 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 the vision is according to the Quranic paradigm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبَصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبَ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he explains that it's not the hearts that go blind, the eyes sorry that go blind, but it's the hearts within people's chests that go blind. So breaking this cycle starts with working on people's hearts so they don't end up dead. So they don't end up blind. And the importance of the heart cannot be overstated, as it is the source from which all of our actions spring. Man is only comp capable of uh, committing such atrocities when they desire that which isn't theirs and when they have a heart that is completely blind. So we pray, we make dua, 
for Allah to heal the hearts of those who have suffered in the Srebrenica massacre. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one, the only one who truly has the power to redress the wrongs that were committed against them. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the oppressors to account as he, he, as he is Ahkam al Hakimin, the most just. We know on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that whoever does an atom weight of good, they'll know about it, they'll see it. And whoever does an atom weight of evil, they'll know about it and they'll see it. Individually, we know this, we believe in this, and this gives us some sense of reconciliation or some sense of uh, consoling. Individually we rectify ourselves, collectively we rectify each other. As a community we come together and offer support through dua, through salah, through charity and whatever it takes. And we always remember, وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he has taken it upon himself to come to the aid of the believers. And we pray that the families of those who lost their lives have the highest ranks in Jannah and that they are never forgotten. And we do not allow ourselves to suffer from historical amnesia when it comes to the Srebrenica massacre. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, even if we do forget, even if we do forget, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive. He says about the Day of Judgment, subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَوْمَ يَبْعَثُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعًا فَيُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect people together on the Day of Judgment and he'll inform them about what they did. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's kept account of everything, even if you've forgotten it. Yeah, they forgot what happened. Yeah, they decided to forget what happened. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he never forgets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept account of it. And they forgot it. Wallahu ala kulli shayin shaheed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a witness over absolutely everything. And on that day, the denial the justification, the smoke screens, the rationalization will not benefit the perpetrators of such atrocities. In fact, they won't be allowed to speak. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Al-Yawma Nakhtimu ala afwahihim. Yeah? On that day, we'll seal their mouths. Doesn't matter, silver tongued or not, you will not be able to justify what you've done. And the, what will Testify for you are your hands. Their hands will speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their feet shall bear witness to what they did and what they had earned. We'll end with this. Allahumma a'izza al-islama wa ahdi al-muslimina ilal-haq. Wa ajma'i kalimatahum ala al-khayr. Wa aksir shawkat al-zhalimin. Wa aktub al-salam wal-amna li-ibadika al-ajma'in. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين